to the Cape Elizabeth School Board March 10th, 2020 meeting, regular business meeting. Can we all stand for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, and indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Are there any adjustments to the agenda? Okay. I uh, may have a motion for approval of board minutes February 11th, 2020. I move we approve the board minutes from February 11th, 2020. And a second? Second that. Cameron. Yeah. Uh, any discussion? Any comments or questions? All those in favor? Great. Uh, comments from our student reps? Um, so a few weeks ago um, on Valentine's Day, we had this safe day and um, it was really successful. There's a lot of positive feedback from the students, um, which was awesome. And then, um, of course, it was especially difficult last week due to the passing of a um, Cape Elizabeth graduate, um, Spencer, um, last Sunday. But there was a lot of support in the school from staff members, teachers, guidance counselors, peers overall, so, um, which was extremely helpful and important for um, those, a lot of us who were grieving. Um, so. Yeah. Um, and um, this Friday we have our winter or spring fling dance, um, which is exciting, followed by Spirit Week next week. So that's on a more lighter note, um, something to bring our uh, community and school together, which I know a lot of students are looking forward to. Um, and there are theme days throughout the week, um, which should be very exciting. Um, and on another note, on the coronavirus note, some students are a little bit nervous about it, but I've seen a lot more hand washing and a lot more hand sanitizer using, less high fives, more fist bumps. Um, so I think students aren't really freaking out that much and have realized that as long as we wash our hands and don't touch each other all the time and stuff like that, it shouldn't be an issue. But yeah, so that's pretty much what's going on in the school right now. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Great. Uh, comments from the public on items that are on the agenda. Is there anyone that would like to speak? <coughs> Excuse me. Thank you, Wynn. Hi, I'm uh, Wynn Phillips. I'm an English teacher at the high school and also president of the Cape Elizabeth Education Association. I just uh, noticed out there that the speech team is going to be recognized, which already makes me a little nervous that I'm <laughs> presenting. But uh, I do look out there and I see uh, a number of those students that I've had in class um, over the past three years. And uh, you got a, it's an outstanding bunch sitting out there. So. Um, and I've heard them pontificate and debate plenty, believe me. Um, I just want to address the, um, the COVID-19 uh, um, plan. And um, I want to thank Donna and uh, at least Jeff, I know, as our building principal has done an outstanding job of keeping us informed. I'd also like to thank Donna for responding to my questions um, regarding uh, hourly employees um, and what we're going to do um, to make sure that they are taken care of if there is uh, the unlikely event of a, of a shutdown. Um, you know, those people uh, rely on, uh, on their paychecks, many of them week to week, and uh, keeping that in mind and thinking about how we're going to, to um, reassure them that they'll be okay is really important. So I just wanted to make sure that that, uh, that, that was out there and that, um, that those people can, can, can feel that from, from you folks. So thank you. Thanks, Any other comments? Okay. 
Next up, we have the Alpine, Maine Alpine team. I have the certificates. And I have the certificates. You bet. So, yeah, let's meet up there. So I think it is becoming a little bit, I'm just going to say one thing first, I think it's become a little bit of a tradition here that um, we try to recognize achievements. Um, tonight we're recognizing some sport achievement, we're recognizing art achievement, we're recognizing speed and debate, um, and typically we have the students come up who are available, receive their award and come around and shake uh, the student rep and the board and Donna's hand, Superintendent Wolfram, and then we like to have people stand in front and take a photograph and document that. Um, in response to the coronavirus, we are going to not shake hands, but we would like students to then be able to, so you could take your seat and then after people are uh, presented their award, come back, because we would still like to recognize it with a photograph. So um, know that we're shaking your hands and our hearts and we're really proud of you. So thank you. So my name is Jen Lockery and I am the coach for the Alpine team. I. Um, feel very lucky to have done this this season. I am not terribly qualified to be an Alpine coach, but these kids let me come and begrudgingly they let, allowed me to whip them into shape if, during preseason. <laughs> there was a little bit of complaining, I'll have to say, but for the most part they did really well. But I was uh, fortunate enough to have like a great mix of seasoned racers and new racers and it was really fun to see the potential and the growth in the new racers and the seasoned racers who would like bring them all under their wings and help them and give them advice. And uh, so the fourths who are behind me right now, uh, they made the Maine State um, Eastern High School <laughs> Championship. Yeah, um, team, so it's the all-state team and they went this weekend to Mount Cannon in New Hampshire and they did a fantastic job. And so I just wanted to recognize the fact that they, Killian here in the center, he made third overall in his combined efforts. The girls placed ninth overall for their team efforts and the boys came in third overall, so they did a really great job. And I'm very proud of them. So we have Killian Lathrop. Next we have Lisa Melanson to present the awards for the speech team, the state champions. Thank you everyone, thank you uh, Superintendent Wolfram and school board members and student representatives, including one of our congressional debate members. Uh, nice to have um, this invitation to be here and to accept this award, this recognition really. Uh, the National Speech and Debate Association's motto is giving youth voice. And I think that's what speech and debate does. It gives students confidence in public speaking, confidence in forming their thoughts and articulating them. And it's a great skill to have, not just going forward, but in their present lives. And as many of you know, especially parents in the audience, the days are long. 
Uh, we often leave Cape Elizabeth High School at about six in the morning and we get back maybe at seven or eight at night. What do they do? They're not speaking in competition that whole time, but often it's the downtime uh, between rounds where they forge friendships with students from schools across Maine, from Bangor uh, down to York. And I think that's one of the other hidden benefits of the activity, the soft skills that they gain in having face-to-face -face conversations and making friendships. So thank you, school board uh, and community, for supporting this activity. I know it's, um, it's a cost uh, that the citizens agreed to pay for, so we're appreciative of that and that the access is open to everyone. Uh, there's no bar to access. And I guess I would say one more thing. Uh, the team was a combination of newcomers and veterans. And at our weekly practices, veterans would often help with the critique section, sessions to help the newcomers. And that was essential to our success. We also had parent volunteers, uh, community volunteers. Many parents served as judges at these Saturday tournaments. Uh, Principal Jeff Shedd served as a judge, frequently giving up his Saturday, so we are thankful for that too. All right, so without further ado, uh, I will, um, let's see, I'll mention even the students that aren't here. Lauren Cutter is not here tonight. I think they're running a mock trial fundraiser at Ellesmere, but Lauren Cutter, um, Caroline Gentili, Ferdows Hakizimana, Rayan Hakizimana, Marco Hansel, who is also at the uh, mock trial fundraiser, I believe. Ayla Mansman, also not here in attendance. Devin Newell, our captain. Aubrey Hannon. Bella Rodriguez is not here tonight. Ben Stone. And Helen Stroud is also not here tonight. Um, so congratulations, all of you. We'd like to have the picture, and if you don't mind, we'd like to include our debate team because they're also at those Saturday tournaments. They didn't win this year, uh, but uh, they're here in support. So debate team members, please come up too. And then next up, we have artist recognition in the MDOE Hall of Flags in the middle school. I'll come up with you. Hey. <laughs> I'm Marguerite Lawler Runner. I'm the middle school art teacher. Last summer, I got invited by the State House to exhibit Cape Elizabeth Middle School artwork. In September, when school started, trimester one, all grade levels five through eight, I put it forth. We called it Art Boot Camp. And if you wanted it, and if you could, the criteria was to complete a piece of artwork under the um, specifications for each grade, but to have something that would project well off the wall. And if you really wanted it, then it would probably happen. We had 40, I believe 47 pieces go to the State House, and we had 38 students go up to the State House for the ceremony at the Hall of Flags. When I had told um, Troy Eastman, my principal, about it, he said, well, we'll get a bus, we'll get some people, we'll go. And I was like, okay. 
So December 10th, we went up to the State House, Donna, Troy, and Officer Dave, and 38 students to uh, see their work at the Department of Education. In the Hall of Flags, Rebecca Millette was there, and I believe the Deputy Commissioner, mm -hmm. And each student went up, shook hands, because we did that back then, <laughs> and uh, received a certificate and had a photograph taken. Afterwards, we went upstairs to the Department of Education and they had organized employees to take each student around to see their artwork and have a photograph taken next to their artwork. The kids were very excited and it was great to see such a volume of work in such a public venue. And it was very exciting to have our superintendent and principal there because that doesn't really happen with art. So thank you. Um, we're going to read off the names, no handshakes. And if anyone showed up late, then just wave your hand and I'll give the name. I want you to. Okay. <laughs> so we have Clark Abrahamson. Henry Adams. Clark, yeah. Henry Adams. There he is. <laughs> Oliver Ames, who is not here. Masa Nisa Ora. Is she He's here? not here. She's not here. Jack's not here. Jack Arit, who is not here. Yes. Eli Berber is not here. Colin Blackburn, who is not here. There's a lot. <laughs> <laughs> so just settle in. She said 48, right? I believe so, yeah. yes. And I might be off. By Zoe Burgard. She's here. Zoe. Oh. A use should hurry. He's not here. Okay. <laughs> Holden Clayman, who is not here. Mason Collins. No. Maura Concannon. <coughs> Ava DeVault. Hayden Doyle. Sage Evans. Ezra Gabrielson. Claire Goodrell. Gabe Harmon, Will Harmon, Tully Hadar, <coughs> Tom Hennessy, oh, this is easy, Phelan Kinsella. <laughs> Brian Lane, Maya LaValle, Mairead Lee, Winchin Liu, Aurora Milton, Azella Morgan, Aiden Morris, Harston Masunik, Layla, Layla Nelson, Graham Plore, Ella Reeves, Noah Scott. Lucy Shaw, yes, she's here. Alberta Stinson, Lulu Stocklin, Hope Taylor, Anna Turner. Bella Ward, Adeline Whitlock, and Addison Young. If you will come up, we'll take a picture of you. Thank you, ladies. <laughs>
Yeah. Seems part of it. I just want to once again thank all the students for their interest and curiosity to do things outside of their regular classroom schedule. Um, I think that's a wonderful aspect that this uh, district and community can provide. I also want to uh, thank the teachers that are willing to give and put in that extra time to make those experiences available. So um, thank you to all. It really enriches the education here. So, have a wonderful night. Thanks. Okay, next up is principal's update. No. Oh no, the nurses. I was just, yep. Yeah. <laughs> the nurses updates. Thank you so much. I thought maybe we were off the hook. I don't know. <laughs> No way. Oh, no way. No All way. Right. My name is Jill Young. I'm the nurse at the middle school. I'm joined tonight by Karen Jenkins, the nurse at the high school, and Erin Taylor, the nurse at Pond Cove. And we're here tonight to provide a brief overview of COVID-19 and the measures that we're taking here at Cape Elizabeth School Department to ensure um, our school community's well-being. Um, so first, I just want to provide a general overview of COVID-19, as if you haven't heard enough about it in the media. But um, coronavirus is a large family of viruses, and I think it's pretty safe to say that each and every one of us in this room has had a coronavirus. That's because within that large family of viruses, it ranges from mild viruses, such as a cold, the common cold, to those more severe viruses, um, such as SARS and now COVID-19. SARS is, um, stands for Severe Acute Respiratory Syndrome. So COVID-19 falls within that. So when we say coronavirus, we're referring to that big family of viruses that we, I'm sure we've had one of. Um, COVID-19 was provided its name by the World Health Organization back on February 11th. It stands for Coronavirus Disease 19. It started in 2019 in China and has since spread throughout the world. Um, in the United States, currently, there are 647 confirmed cases, 25 deaths, uh, and just to put that into perspective, a virus that we're more familiar with, um, influenza, since October 1st in 2019, there's been 32 million cases in the United States alone and 18,000 deaths. So that is a virus that we do have in our school community. Um, it falls in a different family of viruses, but it is one that we have here in our school community. We do not currently have any confirmed cases of coronavirus in the state of Maine, nor do we have any patients under investigation in our school community. Um, that being said, us as a school community and us as school nurses that are here um, with the one common goal to ensure our schools, staff, students, um, and school community's well-being, we want to be proactive. Um, there are steps that we are already taking for virus prevention um, in regards to influenza, and those are very similar steps that we would take um, for any virus, including COVID-19. 
Um, those steps we take at the beginning of flu season every year, I think you all get a letter from us informing you, it's here, it's flu season. Take precautions. Precautions include um, hand washing, it's the number one defense, as well as um, using hand sanitizer with 60% or more of alcohol in that hand sanitizer when you don't have visibly soiled hands. Staying home when you're sick, covering your cough um, and sneezes, just general precautions and it's same regardless of what type of virus it is. Um, so we send out that message at the onset of flu season, which we did late fall this year. Um, we also do th steps to monitor um, our um, number of absences. Us as school nurses, we're constantly monitoring that day to day. Uh, when I noticed that we had a large influx of absences at the middle school mid-January, for the first time I went ahead and also sent a letter out to our staff saying, hey, it's a good idea to encourage frequent hand washing, definitely before snack, which we have at the middle school, and before lunch, and also encourage your students to wipe down their work surfaces since we are constantly changing classes at the middle school. When I informed my administrators, we ordered extra supplies. We ordered hand sanitizer and Clorox wipes so that our students would be able to um, do the best we could in keeping our environment safe and preventing the virus. And that was all for influenza. So now we fast forward and we're wanting to be proactive with COVID-19. Um, those are the same things that we were already doing. We're just being extra vigilant. Um, the proactive pieces that we've done, our school nurses, along with Donna and our school physicians, Mita Santi, we met several weeks ago to revise our pandemic plan, just anticipating that COVID-19 may eventually make its way to Maine. Um, pandemic sounds scary, but we are nowhere near a pandemic um, in the United States. Remember, in the whole United States, there's 647 confirmed cases, none in Maine. So we're just being proactive and extra vigilant again. Um, so we met and revised our pandemic plan. That pandemic plan is available on our website. Um, it has three different stages. We are currently in the preventative stage. Um, that's before, um, so right now, before COVID-19 makes its way to Maine. Should COVID-19 make its way to Maine and become a pandemic, we have that pandemic, the active pandemic stage, as well as a post-pandemic stage. After meeting with admin, um, school nurses, school physician, and superintendent, we then met with all of our staffs um, last week to share the pandemic plan and review COVID-19 with them as well. Uh, since then, we've started that preventative stage, so um, it was communicated that we're going to encourage that hand washing, um, the number one defense for virus prevention, and um, provide hand sanitizer, wipe down those work surfaces, and stay home when we're sick. So just provided that general virus prevention again. Um, and should this turn into something more, that pandemic plan goes into detail as to um, steps that we would take. Discussions were had at each of the schools on um, should this become, should we go into that active stage, what does that look like? And so discussions are happening, people are starting to think outside the box, so we're prepared um, when we, if and when we need to be reactive by being proactive, we're prepared and ready. Um, school nurses now have an opportunity. We've been in constant communication with um, not only the CDC, we utilize their guidelines. Anything that you hear from us is the guidelines that we're getting from the CDC. They're the experts. Um, we are medical professionals in the building, but we get that information from the CDC, as well as the Maine Department of Education, who's worked very closely with the Maine CDC. Um, in communication with the CDC, we as nurses also have an opportunity. Um, since last week, we were invited to the main CDC weekly briefing, which I participated in. It's every Monday um, from 1 to 2 o'clock. Any medical professional in the state is able to tune in and hear the most current information from Dr. Shaw, the director of the main CDC. It was an hour long. It was extremely beneficial. I left feeling like I had the most up-to-date current information to share with my school community. Um, I plan to participate in that every week um, so that we can continue to be current and make the best decisions for our staff and students and community. Uh, a letter went out from Donna a couple of weeks ago, or late last week, and then another one this week. It's simply to provide that clear, transparent communication. There's nothing alarming. Again, there's no confirmed cases in the state of Maine and no patients under investigation from our school community. Um, but we're doing that in hopes of making sure that you know what we know um, and taking steps to be preventative and proactive. 
Um, that letter went out, those are also available on the website. Um, those letters went out just as being proactive. So we're doing that part in constant communication. Um, any updates we get, you will get. Of course, if there is a confirmed case or uh, individual under um, investigation, we will communicate that as well um, in respects to confidentiality, of course. So um, is there anything else that you all want to add? Okay. Anybody have any questions? Uh, I think this question is more of probably for Donna. Uh, so if the schools were ever to be shut down, how do we prepare students to do their academic work or do we not do that? So part of our plan is, they, they were calling it continuity of education. Um, and so I did meet with the principals and we, uh, we talked about um, creating a plan for that. I also talked with um, Joel Her Noel Herof, our um, director of technology, and we talked about technology being available to students. Uh, we talked about it again in our administrative team meeting um, this morning. And actually you're going to hear from the principals um, what the plans are in each of their schools tonight during their principal reports. Um, we were able to, we thought that we would be able to provide technology one-on-one -on -one to grades six through 12, and now today we, uh, we have moved that down to five through 12. So five through 12 students will be taking devices home and communicating with their teachers through devices, and again, you'll hear more about that. Um, part of that, we uh, received word from the um, Department of Education yesterday um, about um, granting waivers to districts who had a plan in place and um, applied for a waiver uh, should schools close down. It seems that they will be fairly um, general in granting their waivers. So, um, but it is also a good chance for us to, uh, and we talked about this this morning, to develop our plan for weather days as well. So once we get this all pulled together and um, down on paper, we can submit it to the Department of Education as um, a weather, for a weather pilot. Uh, so that's um, not that we want this to happen, but it is a good opportunity for us to, to pull our plan together for that as well. So where students will, instead of have missing school for a snow day, they'll be able to go into this um, continuity of education uh, plan at home and um, we, won't ca we won't have that counted as snow days. So, but we have to have a plan approved by um, the Department of Education. So a long answer to <laughs> So the principals will talk about okay. the plan more. Anything else? I have a question. Um, there's a lot of rumors going around. Uh, and according to confidentiality, obviously respecting that, but are there, can you speak to people or students that may have self-quarantined and any information you can give on that? So any staff or students who travel to areas that are level three travel advisories, um, that's four different countries, China, Iran, Korea, and Italy, had they traveled um, to those areas, we follow the CDC's guidelines, which are um, to um, ever changing and ever evolving, just like the viruses, but um, we follow their guidelines. And um, those countries, those level threes, were to self-quarantine. None of our staff or students are symptomatic, and many of them are outside of that 14-day self-quarantine. Um, and we've just asked that um, families and staff be transparent and communicate with regards to any travel um, that they've done so that we can check with the CDC and make sure that we're following their guidelines. Um, there's guidelines specific for those travel three advisories as well as for cruise ships. It's all available on the CDC's website. And again, it is ever changing. We're watching that daily. Um, so initially when we got back from February break, um, those level three, Italy for example was a level three, but within the, the guidance within that level three um, just said to um, self-quarantine if symptomatic and contact your primary care physician. Um, 
that changed uh, the next week to say that guidance changed to say symptomatic or not, the recommendation is to stay home. So checking that day to day, sometimes our guidance changes and that's because the guidance from the CDC changes. Um, cruise ships, um, if you're planning on cruising, I would highly discourage it as when you return. Now the CDC's guidance is to stay home whether you're symptomatic or not for 14 days. So you'll have your cruise and you'll have a two week extension of vacation. <laughs> so um, we're just paying close attention to those travel advisories and any guidance that we provide in regards to travel is through the CDC. Um, and just to mention too, I didn't say this, I know I talked about the weekly briefings with the CDC and um, checking their website daily, but we've also all three been in direct communication with our um, CDC epidemiologist as well. Anytime we have a question, we're on the phone with them. That's great. Uh, so I just want to confirm, there's, there's no cases here in Cape Elizabeth. And there's nobody, no cases in Maine. There's nobody symptomatic. There were a few people that visited these level three countries that self-quarantined. Correct. But they were asymptomatic. Correct. We have not had anyone symptomatic. Um, there are no confirmed cases in the state and no students or staff under investigation in our school community. No COVID-19 at this time. <laughs> okay, and you are checking information daily and we seem to be getting updates when needed, which feels almost daily from the Twice superintendent. Today. Yeah, so we're communicating as best we can, right. it sounds like. Right. And it's coming directly from the CDC and the DOE. Correct. Fantastic, well thank you so much. I know this is giving you extra work and I appreciate all that you're doing to help keep our students in the district safe. Yes. Yeah, thank you so much. Thank you. I'm always so eager for the principal updates. I, I don't know, know why, Just jump right but in. it's uh, time for the principal updates. Jason Mangerini is our on co-principal. Good evening. Welcome. It was really nice tonight to see um, the meeting with high school, middle school, and Pond Cove students in attendance tonight. It's, it was great to see at this, I know it's not so full now, but it's such a great atmosphere when we have that level of attendance. Uh, so I have two things I wanna talk about tonight. Uh, I wanna give um, some recognition to uh, some community members and parents, uh, and then I'll speak to um, Pond Cove's plan um, for a potential school closure due to pandemic. So I really just want to start by, by talking a little bit about, um, you know, there are many reasons I think why we're such an amazing school district and why I can personally attest to the fact that Pond Cove's an amazing school. We have outstanding students, outstanding teachers, and a, a very, very important variable, we have outstanding parents. And in fact, I was having a conversation with a parent um, on Monday after school, a parent of a brand new student, and um, in the discussion, I let him know that one of the major reasons we do so well is because we have parents that ask great questions. Uh, so uh, I wanted to recognize um, a few parents tonight, and as you know, um, we have a new playground, and uh, this, it, this certificate showed up in my office, and I, I wanted, I'll tell you a little bit about it. Um, at first, I wasn't quite sure what it was, and it is, it's an award um, for members of our playground committee. And so my understanding is that the town of Cape Elizabeth nominated this committee um, to receive this award. And there are a few parents here tonight, some very uh, key players. So it's the Spirit of America Foundation Award. And again, I'm, I'm not sure I'm quite qualified to, to you know, present this award. It's not from me, but I just thought it deserved some attention. So what I will tell you about our playground, what I know from being out on the playground daily and talking with teachers and talking with students. It's been an amazing transformation for our school. It is everything that I think the committee hoped it would be and much more than that. In, um, I have to say I was a little doubtful that playground design could be so impactful on um, the student experience out there, but it is just amazing. It's. Um, 
the, the different sections of the playground and how it's partitioned off and, and the opportunities it provides for kids to play. It's just night and day to be out there and watch the kids. So, so again, this is you know, nominated by the town and awarded um, it by uh, members of, of the Senate and House of Representatives of Maine. And so if it's for the Pond Cove, Pond Cove Playground Committee. But so we have tonight, we have Christina Jutz. If you guys could just stand for a minute. Christina and Jessica Morrell and Meredith Beauregard. And we have Lauren Glennon. And so if we could just give them a hand. And also, Erin didn't leave, did she? Oh, she's right there. I was gonna say, so she, she doesn't like it when I put her on the spot. It seems like we're all always celebrating something Erin is doing. But so Erin Taylor, um, a very, very key player in this as well. So if you don't mind. <laughs> not going to stand. So I'm wondering if maybe I'll just hand it off to Lauren or whomever. But. And then would you all be willing to come up for a photo? Jason, Please. do you have your phone on you? Could you take a photo? I can. Yes. But That'd Jason, be great. Jason will be in the picture. Huh? <laughs> oh, Jason. Yeah, maybe Allie. Shall do you have a, <laughs> Allie can do it for us. Oh, Allie can do it. Okay. Yeah. Great. All right. We want you in the picture. Okay. And I just want to, before we take the picture, can I just say, Erin, when did you start this process? Five years ago? Six years ago. So her dedication has been for six years trying to make this happen. So thank you, ladies, for bringing it forward. You can do this. Yay. Great. So I will speak, uh, in respect of time, I'll speak briefly, but of course answer any questions you have. So um, I wanted just to share with you a little bit about Pond Cove's plan. So as Donna mentioned, the, t the technology piece in terms of um, using technology for staff to communicate directly with students was six through 12 and is now, it looks like it's going to be five through 12. And it's kind of a different conversation with K-4. And so what we have come up with a plan, um, you know, in the event of a school closure, thinking it could be a week or two if it was to happen, um, we wanted to make sure that um, students and families had some clear guidance on what to do. So. Um, currently, teachers are working on, each grade level team is working together uh, to create a supporting document that would be sent home in, in the event of a school closure. And the idea for this document is that um, it would be contain ideas for maintaining a reading, writing, math routine at home. So students would be practicing grade level skills um, and we would be giving suggestions on, on activities to do that and, um, and frequency and duration of time that, that we would suggest. Um, that we, and we know it would be difficult. I mean, students would be potentially in childcare or not or with other relatives, but we just want to give our best shot at, at um, making sure kids can stay in the game and, and continue to practice skills. So for example, um, a grade level team would prepare a document and it would, it would give um, some, some guidance on reading or reading to a child um, and some things that you could talk about. It could give some guidance on writing in terms of journaling and things like that. Um, also math would um, provide opportunities for students to practice grade level math skills, some grade level math skills, um, with some things that are around the house, but also there would be links to online resources um, that students could access from home potentially to practice some of those skills. Uh, so that's really the gist of what we would we would do at the K-4 level. That's the plan so far. Are there questions about that? Will there be any uh, resources available via phone or online from teachers? 
So at this time, where we wouldn't be sending one-to-one -one devices home with K4, we wouldn't be relying on that. So certainly some level of communication from teachers, but we're assuming that all students wouldn't have access to a device, unlike grades five through 12, where we would actually be providing the device and could count on that. So we're trying our best to primarily um, provide these opportunities without the need for a device. But there certainly would be communication, and depending on how it all played out, the first communication would be sending this plan out to them and kind of describing how to follow it. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Okay, thank you. follow Jason again with a picture and all of those things he always is hard act to follow so um, but kind of following up on something Jason said as I was sitting there it's pretty amazing it kind of just makes you think for a minute um, the amount of talent that was just in our room tonight from the kids to the staff to the parents it's it really is a pretty unique place to work I think it's, I think it's easy to see where the success comes from um, and, it's, and it is a collaborative effort that makes that happen. Um, I feel fortunate in some schools. I know principals are trying to become, you know, the COVID-19 expert and the letter writer of all that. And I kind of just walk two doors down and talk to Jill and, and kind of pass it off um, <laughs> because she knows more about it than me. But we're just, there are so many experts in each of the areas that there seems to be a need that I just, I think we're fortunate to, to be here and, and work with who we work with. So um, sometimes it takes something like this to bring that out and, and really realize the individual strengths that people have. So um, again, it's just, I, th I think we're, we're lucky to be here. So um, really quickly, I think the power of trying to figure this plan out for, for how, what we would do in case of a school closure is to realize it's not gonna replace what we do every day. Um, I think it's an effort to maintain um, some contact with our kids, and that was really the focus of, of where our teachers went. We've talked about it for one day at a staff at an uh, early release last week, and tomorrow's staff meeting is going to be dedicated to this. But largely, it's an effort for our teachers to maintain some normalcy with our kids in a pretty awkward time, you know, being out of school when we're not used to being out of school. So that really is kind of the major goal. And we're fortunate because a lot of what we do is one-to-one -one and, and done through um, technology, but we have to conduct an internet access survey to really know, like we say that everybody can get it, but can really everybody get it? And we need to really know that um, and have an alternative plan for those that maybe can't. Um, so that's one of them. I mean, I guess we could have people go park in the school parking lot and get the access from outside, but eh, probably not the best learning environment. Same thing with the library. I'm assuming that may be closed if schools are closed. So some of those quick thinking ideas, I think, those are, those are issues that we gotta really kind of plan for and think about. Um, and then really for us at the middle school, it turns into grade level team planning. Um, you know, what's fifth grade gonna do? Sixth grade, seventh grade, eighth grade. Um, a lot of what we do happens through Google Classroom and Google Hangouts already, and Google Docs allow for that real time kind of interaction on your writing or on whatever you're doing um, with your teacher. So it's really about, I think, picking a time. And teachers that I've talked to have talked a little bit about well, I usually meet my kids at eight, so that first period, that'll be our check-in. I usually meet my second period at nine, that will be my check-in. So things like that is kind of, is kind of the way the thinking's going. Um, I think our teachers have different levels of comfort with technology. I think some maybe feel like they're in your house. <laughs> and others it may be you know, more of a check-in through email. So I think there's gonna be a wide range we have a lot of online textbooks. Most of, our, most of our math programs have an online textbook component. Uh, I know we have a lot of teachers that have made personal videos to support kids as they go through that. We have IXL. So we have a lot of resources, I think, to support that kind of learning. There's nothing wrong with the old traditional sit down and read a good book and figure out how we communicate that reading and maybe form some smaller book groups from that that could be reading the same book and communicating. So there's, some, I think, some pretty neat ideas like that going on. And really, we have some teachers that have talked about practicing this from room to room. Like, hey, what would happen if we just, I go sit in your room, you go sit in my room, I'll teach my class, you teach your class from different rooms. They'd still be an adult in there supervising that way. So it's kind of making people think a little differently about how they do what they do, which I think is always a good thing. 
And then lastly, um, the priority I think for us is really that keeping that contact with kids again and, and providing that check-in time. And so they know that we, that we care that they're engaged in, in participating. So that's kind of it. I think it'll be a little more structured tomorrow um, after our meeting, but that's kind of the guidelines. Yeah, so I have a question. Um, so it's good to know that you will be involved, and since your kids are older than the Pond Cove, you will be using Google Docs in, in that nature. Question to you and to others as well. When you plan for this, are you planning for uh, a week shutdown, a month shutdown, two months shutdown, three months shutdown? How are you guys preparing for that? I think that's a moving target, but I think right now the corn that I'm looking at Jill because if I say it wrong, I'm probably going to hear about it. No. Um, but I think right now the, it's a 14-day kind of incubation period. And so to me, I think planning for less than that, no. Please don't take it that the middle school principal said we're shutting down for two weeks. Not what I'm saying. But I think that it would – we're putting a lot of time into planning, so I, th I think we're planned for it if it was more than a week. Okay. General, general question. First of all, I want to thank everyone. This has been very thoughtful um, to echo Mr. Phillips' comment at the beginning. Um, I think the emails at the very beginning were very helpful, and so much so that we even forwarded it to our preschool because we, parents were getting questions. And um, so there's a preschool in, in Portland that got your email, and oh, we had a lot of comments saying that was very helpful because they didn't have information. Um, the question I have, and maybe there's not an easy answer, but schools obviously provide a lot more for our kids than just learning. And so there's, I've got some concerns about, you know, other services that kids would be getting they would not be able to get, and maybe the answer is we just couldn't provide them during a shutdown. But there are some essential services I think some kids get, including uh, free meals. And if there's any, you know, and for some kids, that may be the only meal they're going to have, at least for half the day. And if there's anything that we can do to plan for that, or, or is that just something that would not be possible during a shutdown? No, that actually is part of our plan. Um, I met with Peter Esposito, um, our Director of Nutrition Services, and um, the, um, the guideline now is that children should, the meal should be eaten in school, so uh, free and reduced students would come to school, and he has published the times. It's in, it, in our plan when they would come to school um, to have their meal. Uh, we're trying to get a waiver. Um, I know the, uh, the main Department of Education is uh, working on a waiver from the feds so that meals could be delivered to the house. So what, if and when that happens, uh, we would be able to um, pack boxes, our food service people would pack boxes that they could deliver. But right now, um, as far as the guidelines go, they, they are required to come to school um, to eat their meal. So we would provide that. Great, so clarification, you. are those legal guidelines that we yeah. are not allowed to go? Yes, yes. They were not allowed yes, to go Yes, it's home. part of the school lunch. Okay. Guidelines. That's helpful, thank you. Yeah. And it's outlined in the plan and the times for people at home, the times when the, uh, the meals would be served is in our plan that's on the website, so. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Jeff. So I'm also going to talk about what we're doing, what we're talking about, and sort of where we are in our planning. Um, and first I want to say I wish everybody could hear that very calming, factual presentation by the school nurses, um, because that, those are the facts, and, and that's what I think they're doing a really good job of. And I, it also caused me to reflect as I was sitting in the chair that um, a couple years ago the school board invested taxpayer money and the town council and citizens supported uh, an increase in the budget to allow for there to be a full-time nurse in each one of the school buildings. And I think that the dividend from that is, is we're, we're getting the benefit, we, we get the benefits of that every day. We're getting the public benefits of that today in terms of what they bring to the table. Um, I know I've 
talk to Karen more in the last two, two or three days. Um, we talk to one another frequently, but we've been having frequent mini conversations here and there about the about things. So I'm very grateful for Karen's presence and I know the other principals for the, the nurses in their buildings. It's really comforting. Um, so where we are is there are, as, as has been mentioned, there are cleaning sort of preventative precautions that are in place. The custodians are doing a nice job of. Um, teachers are helping out with that by trying to do their best to clean, ta to keep table surfaces clear so that custodians can clean, uh, which is the exact opposite of what we've asked them to do for quite a long time. And for many years, the advice was please clear the floors, and now the advice is please clear the surfaces. So teachers are learning new habits and adjusting to that. Um, so last Wednesday, as we did at all three of the schools, um, the high school staff met for about an hour during early release Wednesday. We talked about um, we, we talked about the medical factors. Um, we, and Ginger Raspiller, who's our technology integrator, and Carolyn Young, who's our library media center um, person, who's also fabulous with technology, sort of took the lead in introducing teachers to a number of different options for technology. Um, that, that teachers could use in the event we had to do some distance learning for a time. Um, since then, Ginger and Carolyn have been going around taking advantage of common planning periods that are no, most of our departments have and meeting with teachers individually or in small groups to get feedback and offer some more support and get questions. And Carolyn and Ginger are again going to be presenting at tomorrow's faculty meeting. Um, and I think most of the time, um, from a conversation with Ginger at the end of the day today, what teachers are really wanting is time to actually work um, and practice on, with the presence and the, and the availability of support that Ginger and Carolyn and other colleagues can provide to them. So when we were talking last week with the faculty, one of the things we talked about a lot was a, a program called Google Meet, I think is the current name of it. It used to have a different name. I don't remember what it was. Um, so, anyway, it's, an on, it's a video conferencing capability that comes through the Google Suite. Um, and there may be some teachers who use that, but um, Carolyn and Ginger and talking with teachers think that that may not be the most frequently used tool. The more frequently is probably going to be Google Documents because it's more versatile. Um, I think what teachers are wanting to do, those who do, don't have familiarity with how to present like short instructional videos that can be um, shared with students through Google Classroom. I think we're also, we also talked yesterday about opening up uh, another Google Suite app called Google Chat, uh, which is essentially a real-time um, text chat, not, not video chat, but text chat capability, which is less logistically complex um, and therefore more likely to work, um, we hope, smoothly. There are some risk, there are some downsides to that as well because once we open it up, um, th there's not 100% control on it, but um, we're, we think we'll be fine. They're not significant risks at all. Um, there's another program called Edpuzzle that we've introduced a lot of teachers to. It's basically where teachers can share videos and they can actually embed questions or they can embed little videos of themselves within the questions. So, um, but Google Doc, I suspect, is going to be the most versatile, frequently used tool if it comes to what we're talking about. Um, so I would say that we are working through it. Um, we are spending time, the nurses most especially on the CDC website and others of us peek occasionally to see what the numbers look like. Um, I would say that we are preparing for the worst and hoping for better than the worst. I'm not gonna say hoping for the best because the best would be all goes away and <laughs> don't think that's gonna happen. So, questions? Uh, I, I just would like to say thank you to, to all of you. I know it's um, taken a ton of time to kind of put these plans into place, and I really appreciate the proactive and thoughtful uh, nature of all that you guys have worked on and reported out tonight. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thanks, Jeff. Um, following up with what Kimberly said, I just want to emphasize what you had mentioned, Donna, that. Uh, a silver lining in all of this is that this potentially could be a plan used in the future for no school days mm -hmm. when they have to get canceled because of weather or situations. And so um, 
there's a, an extra way that it can be beneficial for us. So, uh, okay, Director of Special Services. Thank you, principals. Good evening. Um, I, uh, I'll focus as well on what the plan would be for students so in special education or that receive special education services. Um, with regard to, and of course, everything, well, special education is really about equal access. So when we talk about making modified plans, then we would try to, uh, what are, what are the, all the other students receiving and how could that be delivered to our students who receive specially designed instruction? Um, so, and I'll kind of break it apart. So at Pond Cove, uh, where it sounds, Jason and I have talked briefly and we haven't had a whole lot of time with the special ed staff to discuss this, but um, if there's grade level plans that are going out, that the idea would be that those students in those grade levels who have specially designed instructions or individualized plans, theirs would uh, be individualized in the sense if they're receiving uh, specially designed instruction, let's say in literacy, that that literacy in instructor or the special education teacher is going to have some input on what might be appropriate activities for the home and as well as kind of spell out like what, what their instructional level is. Um, at that particular moment in time. So I guess we would try to individualize those plans as, as the best we could. With regard to fifth through 12th, who will have access, uh, electronic act, digital access there um, and teachers would be interacting with those students is that the special education teachers and uh, the related services would be interacting with those students as well um, in the sense that if a student is receiving specially designed instruction for literacy or math outside of the classroom uh, at a certain block of time every day that they would be receiving contact and instruction from that spe special education teacher at that time. And we would do our best to try to do the same with um, some of our related services, it would be much trickier. Um, social work and speech and language could certainly be doing check-ins and some of the speech and language could be done digitally depending on what the goals are. Um, physical therapy and occupational therapy would be um, very tricky, but as, as I think the, the minimum expectation would be a check-in and um, possibly some discussion with the student and or their parents with, with what activities they might be able to do at home, again, to maintain skills. Um, and that's, do you have any questions? Um, and mind you, we haven't been able to spend, we discussed this this morning at A-Team, but we really haven't been able to spend a lot of time with the, the staff kind of brainstorming these pieces. Some of our students, not uh, certainly a, a minimum number, but some students would need to practice these skills before we put them in place. And so we will be working with some of the special education teachers on making sure that happens before we ever get to that point. A question. Sure. And it's not just for special ed students, uh, it's more to a uh, point that we're doing more than academics. And so I just came up with the idea, what are we doing in reference to teaching? If we're going to be at home, so students are going to be at home for 14 days, in reference to stretches, yoga, exercise, um, there are games that people can exercise to. There's Fitbits people have. So does athletic director have anything that they can find in videos and share with the students to whether it's dancing, anything to move at home? Otherwise, you're gonna have students coming back after 14 days and put them back in the shapes. <laughs> Uh, parents would probably appreciate all of the above. Uh, I can speak to the, uh, the ther therapist. I'm sure that the occupational therapist and the physical therapist would be doing just that with some of their students um, and encouraging movement and uh, as well as physical activity if, to the extent that it's possible. Um, I don't really want to speak to the physical education piece. We certainly didn't have that conversation, but uh, <laughs> I'm not point, sure if there's a creative way to um, discuss that or not. <laughs> Thank you. 
thing. Any other questions? My kids will be outside. Thanks, Thank Del. You. Thank you. <laughs> Kathy Stanker. Well, for better or worse, I got nothing to say about COVID-19 or the coronavirus. <laughs> um, I want to talk to you about what's going to happen, assuming we're in school, which I am assuming. Um, so it's been a while since I gave you an update on the things happening in professional development. Um, so I thought I'd take a couple of minutes just to catch you up. Um, at Pond Cove, we're putting reading under the microscope. Our teachers have been and will continue to be revising their grade level learning targets to ensure alignment to the main learning results. Um, once that horizon horizontal alignment is assured, which will happen before the end of the year, then we're going to be looking at that K-4 alignment. Um, and I would expect that you'd see those changes on next year's report card. In addition, because these are just broad standards of what students should know and be able to do at the end of each grade level in reading, um, the next step is going to be for the teachers to talk about how they assess um, those learning targets um, and how they instruct to them. And honestly, this is something that teachers have been talking about wanting to do for the three and a half years that I've been here, so um, we're just really excited that it's finally happening. Um, at the middle school, the next PD Wednesday, it'll be the third and final meeting of the RTI cohorts that Troy and I talked to you about at the beginning of this year. Just as a reminder, these are, there are four different cohorts. Um, all staff at the middle school participate in them. Uh, there's one on classroom culture that is facilitated by interventionist Joe Doan, one on executive functioning that's facilitated by social worker Sarah Hansen, one on student-centered instruction that's facilitated by interventionist Jake Hogovic, and then one on mindfulness, and that's facilitated by the other social worker, Louise Lynch. Um, and the feedback um, regarding these cohorts has just been incredibly positive, and so the plan is um, staff will rotate into another one when they haven't done yet next year, and that that will continue um, for the, the two following years as well. And then at the high school, the teachers are continuing to alternate their PD Wednesdays between department work and then these interdisciplinary professional learning groups. And I hope at a later date to have more information for you um, closer to the end of the year about what they feel they accomplished. So that's professional development. And then um, again, assuming, what is it Jeff said? The um, not the best, but not the worst. Um, the MEA testing window for students in grades three through eight opens next week, and principals have been in touch with regarding the specific schedule, so if you can just make sure that your child is present, barring illness, of course, um, and that they are ready to focus, and good night's sleep helps, um, and, a, and a good breakfast. And then the GT screening process for students in third grade has begun. Parents have been notified. Um, the screening process for students in fifth and seventh grade will take place in May. The, um, just two more things. The, um, the overview of the new website that I shared with you at the last meeting has been emailed to parents. It's also available on the Parents Guardian section of the website under website overview. Um, if you can't find something, and this is not just for you all, but for everybody watching at home, um, please let us know. Um, we'll direct you to it, or if it's not there, we'll make sure we get it up. And then finally, hot off the press, um, just this afternoon, our uh, evaluation committee uh, finalized the Educator Performance Evaluation and Professional Growth Plan. Um, we're very excited to have this done because um, this will, will uh, guide the evaluation and super supervision process going forward. Questions? You want to know what I think about the coronavirus? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> do tell, do tell. <laughs> Hi, good evening. Hi, Marcy. So in our budget world, we are now, um, as of the end of February, we were at 63% spent for our general fund. And the normal spending pattern would have been 67% at that time. Next month, our percentage spread might be tighter because we have some debt service payments that we're paying this current month. So it might not look as far apart. But last year at this time, we were at 64% spend. So we're kind of right on target with that. The um, maintenance and repair items that I'm having the most concern with are at 87% right now, and last year they were at 78%. So I'm watching those to see what happens the month of March. We have four months remaining. Our focus for the rest of the year will be um, 
definitely on our financials, finishing our budget, and now preparing for audit work for this current year, for fiscal year 20. So that will be my focus and it's on my mind. Hopefully I'll be able to provide some fund balance projections for you in the next few months so we can get um, ready for the end of the year with our numbers. Any questions? Great. Any questions? Thank you so much. Thanks. Thank you. Thanks, Marcy. So a um, little budget update. We asked uh, Maine Benefits Trust uh, when they will release their expected range. They first release a range and they tell you, well, your, your increase for your health benefits won't be any less than this or more than this in the state. Um, and they reported that they hope to release the range on March 20th, so we're looking forward to that and hopefully that will allow us to drop some um, percentage points in our budget or at least um, some, some money in, in our budget we can reduce. Um, and we should get our individual uh, school district notification uh, of increases no later than April 3rd. So that's cutting it very close to um, the end of our budget season, but um, that's the expectation um, from them. Uh, you remember that we have included a 10% increase as a placeholder, so we're hoping for less than that, a lot less than that, we'll see. Uh, the, for the people at home and for the people in the audience, there will be a budget workshop tomorrow night at 6.30 uh, at the Cape Elizabeth Middle School in the library, and we will discuss fund balance and the expected budget increase. I'd like to invite everyone uh, in the audience to attend. Um, I'll be pos posting a budget update after the meeting, which I do after every meeting. Um, and those budget updates are available on our website. Um, on, on the uh, FY21 um, button on our homepage, so they're pretty easy to access, complete with videos. So uh, I have some good news tonight. Um, we just received word from the state that we'll, we will be receiving an additional $75,675.72 uh, for students who are attending Cape Elizabeth who um, are, we call it uh, superintendent's agreement students, uh, which means that the superintendent of the sending district and, and I have agreed that we will accept those students. Um, and uh, the, the funding is from those students who um, whose districts receive more in subsidy than we do and we receive a very low amount um, uh, for, per student. So, and we uh, have quite a few students that we take into our district. Um, this has never happened before in the state, so we are happy to accept that 75,000 uh, extra dollars. So that will, and that is for the FY20 budget as a revenue. So um, that will really help our budget situation this year. We're getting students as well with our numbers? We already have the students. We already have the students, yes. okay. Yes. Was that yes. something you had to ask for? Or did that, um, did you have to? Uh, Marcy was at a meeting and heard that this money might be available and it was on a first come first serve basis. So guess who was first? Right. <laughs> yet again. Once, yeah. Yeah. Once again. It's yet again another example. Thank you, Marcy. That she didn't just fall in our lap. We had to make that happen, it sounds like. Yes, Marcy Very made much. it happen. Thank so you to so clarify, much. we always had these students um, and we just didn't know that we could get um, no, every year they have to reapply um, to attend our, our school district. But we've always had students. Yes, we've always That's had students right. on That's a superintendent's right. agreement. Is yes. this the first year in a long time that this funding has even been available? It's never been available. Yeah, it's never been available. Okay, so it's not that we didn't know in previous no, years to no, apply for it. This is no, just the first year. No, to our knowledge, year. Okay. Never, I've never heard of it, so. Okay. So 75,000? Yes, very good. Excellent. So again, as you heard uh, A-Team at this morning for a lengthy discussion on the plans that we've made for the continuity of instruction uh, should schools need to close. And um, I, I would, um, with, uh, they, uh, CDC, I was at a meeting on Friday, CDC has assured us that um, if they have any concerns about anyone in our schools, um, they would be in touch with us immediately. Um, and then we would discuss next steps. Um, so uh, 
I would be apparently the one that would call school just as in a weather closure. So, but of course I would let the board know, so. And we would send out, um, similar to what we do for weather closures, we would send out um, information similar to that. So um, hopefully it won't, have, it won't come to that, so that's Great. it. Thank you so much. Right. Is, there, is there a name for the program for the 75,000? Is there a name? Is there a name for the 75,000 program? Um, it's just like reimbursed. basically if a, our student goes to, say, for example, Baxter Academy, some money, well, we had to send the money to them, money will follow them? No. That's, that's totally different. Uh, well, that's, that's basically what happened this year for the first time. We call it a superintendent's agreement okay, or superintendent. a superintendent's waiver, but okay. um, we call it a superintendent's agreement. Okay. And both superintendents in, in the sending district and the receiving district have to agree um, on this plan for the students. Okay. So. Thank you. Okay, may I have a motion for new business item A? I move we approve the following 2019-2020 co-curricular stipends as set out in our agenda under item 7A. May I have a second? Second. Great. Any questions or comments? All those in favor? Excellent. Item B, may I have a motion please? I move we approve the Cape um, Elizabeth High School mock trial team field trip to Evansville, um, Indiana on May 5th to the 10th, 2020 for the National High School mock trial competition. May I have a second? Second. second and any comments? I think it is amazing that our mock trial always seems to do so well, and here they are headed to Indiana. Is this the final? The, the, the states, states? Oh, the, the, the national, national, the national, right? States. Like this is a yeah. big deal. Yes. Yeah. Um, this is they've they've worked really hard to get to this point. So uh, I think this has just been a wonderful meeting to see all the the successes that our students have in this district and on such a varying degree, so congratulations. Um, any other comments? All those in favor? Yes, thank you. Uh, next item, item C on the agenda. May I have a motion? I move that we approve the Capital High School Program of Studies 2020-2021. Mm. May I have a second? Second. Uh, any comments? Would Jeff be willing to come up yeah. and just talk about anything that would, would be notably different or what's <laughs> what's going on in the program of studies? <laughs> in this document? <laughs> uh, so the, there are a few new course offerings. Um, I was just looking up the pages because I have a list of it, but I don't have them all done yet. So, uh, um, so I will say that one of the things I think that I mentioned at a previous board meeting, I don't remember when, is that we have listed the programs that there are at the Westbrook Vocational Center that are not at the Portland Arts and Technology High School. Those are on page 60 and 61 in, in your program of studies. Um, so you, you can see those and those are obvious. All of these, this is the program of studies available online. So all of these things are listed on the course selection sheets that students are getting as well. But there's, there's a good varied list of courses that Westbrook has that Paz mm -hmm. doesn't. So we're hoping um, that we will get some takers on some of those. I believe we will. Nate Carpenter is working really hard um, on this with a number of other people as well. So we have added in the science curriculum, and this one happens to be on page 40, I know, um, we, an AP chemistry class. Um, part of the reason for that I want to explain is that um, AP biology is a junior year class, but it meets two periods. Uh, 
Did you take it out? I didn't. Know. You did? Good. So it meets it meets two periods, but it meets a whole all year one period, and then every day of rotation for one semester for another period. It's a huge chunk of a teacher's assignment. We cannot, we will not under any scenario have the staff to offer two sections of that because that would mean tying up four periods of a teacher's schedule for the first semester. So one of the reasons we decided to add AP Chemistry, which we haven't had before, is um, that is a course that can actually be offered without any additional lab time, primarily because our honors chemistry class that sophomores take is so strong. Um, so we're hoping that that will attract some juniors and maybe some seniors as well who, as another alternative to AP biology. So that, that's sort of the background of that. And so then other new courses, there's a few in the, well, world language, French one is listed. I didn't get as far as that page, I'm sorry. The departments are listed by alphabetical um, if you're looking for it. So world, there's a table of contents in the beginning, uh, but if you look for world language, that's right at the end of the program of studies, you'll find that course. Um, the arts, there's a number um, under theater. Um, and again, this is assuming we can get signups for students and assuming we can get some staffing changes, um, which is all an unknown and students are well aware of that. But we're offering uh, a semester elective called Intro to Dance. Um, and then there's another dance workshop course. Those are on pages 18 and 19 of the program of studies. And that would be taught by Christine Marshall because dance is, falls under theater and Christine personally has a lot of experience teaching dance. Um, and then under music, there's a few offerings. There is a second, and I think they start on page 16. So I think it's probably 16 and 17. Um, we have always had a music theory elective. Um, Mr. Scarponi is also offering a music theory two elective, which can be taken at the advanced placement level or not um, by students if they're interested in that. And he is also offering, and again, this all depends on signups. If the music things happen, we could offer them without, there's no staffing implications to these particular courses. Um, but he's offering percussion studies, if there are students who are interested in uh, working with a percussion ensemble. And he's also offering a class, I think that this particular version of the program of studies is not quite the final version because of the neat title in here is a little bit off, but it's basically something to the effect of instrumental music intensive. And it's basically, if there are students who are interested in having some individual support for Mr. Scarponi on their particular instrument, then he is happy to help them with that. Um, and I think those are the new offerings. Yeah, I believe that those are all of the new offerings that we have for, for next year. Is there anything that's being taken away? I mean, aside from electives, I understand that if there's not the sign up, then it doesn't happen and that kind of thing, but. We have not removed anything. Okay. Yep. Yep. Any questions? Thank you for that. Thank you. Sure. Yeah, thank and that fill-in explanation. Okay. Any other discussion among ourselves about the program of studies? All right. All in favor? Um, a motion for item D, 7D. I move that we consider to approve policy second reading JLF. May I have a second? Second. Uh, maybe some discussion. Hope, can you fill us in, please? Sure. So uh, JLF is our existing policy reporting child abuse and neglect, and uh, we made some clarifications. Um, the changes mostly involve clarifying the process for reporting any suspected or known incidents of child abuse or neglect. Um, and a part of our clarification is that we've, we've later we're gonna talk about um, JLFA, which is 
a related policy for child sexual abuse. So we put a clarification here that if you're looking at this policy, be aware there's also another policy specifically addressing sexual abuse. Um, so we've added those references, um, and then we've, we've customized it to match our current um, state of the world. So with respect to um, the reporting, it's gonna go to the school administrator, the Title IX coordinator, who is Kathy Stankard, uh, or the superintendent. And then up from there, it goes to either the Department of um, the DHS or the DA. Um, I don't think there's anything else to highlight. Um, we did add a section on training, um, required um, um, the training that each employee is required to have. Any questions? I have a question, Hope. Uh, where in this section, I'm sure there is here, where is a child is protective and encouraged to come forward and information will be held confidential? Uh, with respect to encouraging come, coming forward, I mean, we don't really have a policy that sort of addresses the student body in terms of, um, you know, sort of, hey, if there's an issue. But I, I think what you're referencing is something that's covered under ACAA, which is our the, the policy of, uh, that states the district's position on sexual harassment and um, which, it, which it encompasses sexual assault as well. So we state in ACAA, which we'll talk about in a moment, um, we state that the district has a policy of, of, of no sexual harassment and, and we, in that situation, there is a confidential, um, there are certain employees in the district that students can come to and know that there's going to be a confidential treatment of that conversation. So. Well, I know these are delicate policies to work with and um, to choose language that's spot on. So thank you for your dedication and time in working on it. Uh, all those in favor? And item 7F, may I have a movement? Oh. Did I miss it? Well, oh, I see. Just a yeah. review, no vote required, but. Uh, so item E, it's the review of the document you were talking about, is that correct, Hope? The JLFR and the JLF? The JLFR is the procedure, the administrative procedure, right. which is technically not a school board approval, but we're just yep. reviewing it and we're, we can talk mm -hmm. about it. Great. Do you have anything you'd like to say about it? Um, it's, it's, it kind of goes into more detail regarding um, specifics around uh, how the reporting goes up the chain from the individual who receives the information to mm -hmm. the school administrator, Title IX coordinator, or superintendent, and then it goes to the, to the DHHS or the DA, and it talks about time frames. So we're talking about 24 hours to report to the DHHS. Um, and then for other other um, incidents, it's going to the DA. So it, it gets into more detail around those mm -hmm. time frames, which I think are important to clarify for anyone who's looking to say, how, what do I do and, and when and how do I need to do mm -hmm. it? That's great. And JLFE is the form that's used. So okay. R is the oh, yeah. process, and then E is the form that the individual uses. I have a question about the form, Hope, and I could be thinking about the wrong form because there were a lot of forms in conversation <laughs> during these meetings, but where it says this form is for school department use only is not to be sent to DHHS or the DA, were we going to add something unless specifically requested by, do you know what I'm talking about? There was a possibility that there was a certain circumstance under which this form would be sent. Kathy's shaking her head, so I don't feel completely out of. Do you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, it's in the procedure. It's in the policy and the procedure. Okay, so I don't know if, if we want to amend the form just to be extra clear, because I remember when we were talking in the meeting with um, so the, the psychologist. That they, yeah, so I think. I think, and I recall what you're talking about, I think what happened was the, the, po the procedure used to say it would be sent to the DA and then it conflicted with this p comment in the form. Is that, is that accurate? 
But I, we did also, like there, so I think what I heard was that this, this form for, is for school department use only, is not to be sent to DHHS or the DA, but then I also heard that there are specific circumstances when it they could be requested, requested by the relevant agency. Right, yeah. so I think, please. Can, can you go speak? As I recall, the social workers particularly were, particularly were really concerned that somebody who was completing that form um, would might feel that they had to immediately send it off instead of just making the phone call. And so they wanted it in big, bold letters. Um, the only time we would share that form would be if it were to be specifically requested and that request would go to the superintendent and we would know what those circumstances, like we would know that we had to fulfill that obligation. But they particularly wanted it worded the Got way it. it was. Just so there was no okay. confusion. But, okay, I just wanted to make sure like, yeah. I wasn't asleep. Like, I knew what I was right. talking right. about. Right, right. Okay. We will only provide that if we are if we receive a specific, a specific request yeah. to do so. Otherwise, it stays in house. Thank you. Should that be added then there though? It is not to be sent to DHS or the DA unless that verbiage or just so that it doesn't look, because the way it reads now, it's like you can never send this form. So, so maybe just to, add, to further okay. clarify. And we don't need to approve that. Yep. No. No, no, we don't need to. Okay, any more discussion? Okay, now we're on item F. May I have a movement? A motion that we uh, consider to approve policy second reading JLFA. And second? Second. <laughs> Discussion. So this is the policy I referenced earlier. This is the sub subset of the child abuse prevention and response um, concept specifically addressing child sexual abuse. Um, and this is the, um, we followed the, the sample form provided by the state and we modified it to, to our needs and to be a little bit more clear with respect to uh, the difference of what happens when um, the suspected individual is either uh, someone responsible for the child or a person who's not a party responsible for the child. Great, all those in favor? So then we have, we move on with policy, but for first reading for ACAA, do you mind speaking to that? Oh. Sure. Uh, so ACAA is our harassment and sexual harassment of students policy, and Nazar, to address your point earlier, this is, um, this is our, you know, sort of our district policy on harassment and sexual harassment. And we've had this policy, it's been in place for a while, but what we did um, in this round was we wanted to address um, the specific um, detail of sexual violence, so including sexual assault. So that wasn't clear in the policy and we've made it so now. Um, we've also then included a reference to policy JLFA um, in that, there are going to be instances where there might be a sexual assault that also falls under the category of, of child abuse. Um, and then the critical change that we've made here is we've included this concept of confidential employees. And I may have alluded to this in previous meetings. And what this is, this is intended to be um, something for the board to address uh, the concern of certain employees within the district who have uh, requirements under their state licensure to maintain confidentiality when they're in a client professional, um, a professional with client um, situation. So their concern is that they're in situations where um, they do need to maintain confidentiality and they want it to be clear that, that that's going to be respected. Um, and we've done this here by, by identifying um, those individuals who have state licenses that, uh, that include an obligation of confidentiality. 
And then what we've specifically done is said, um, those employees are not required to divulge information. This is a safe place where the student can come and they're going to be, their, their trust will be maintained. And the only exception to that is the state mandatory reporting requirement okay. for child sexual abuse, or child abuse, sorry. So that's what this confidential employee, and this is a unique provision that's not part of a, you know, you won't find this in other districts, so I think we're, um, uh, on the you know the vanguard here addressing this this nuance and, and hopefully it gives uh, our staff um, comfort and also it will give anyone looking at this policy um, the knowledge that they they do have a safe place to go with these issues and it's going to be their confidentiality will be respected uh, when they go to those certain staff members. Yeah, I'm thinking that um, the social workers and. Psychologists in the school must be very pleased to have this piece in it because I know the confidentiality piece of the mandatory <coughs> reporting conversations that happened this fall, um, they, they were a hard pill to swallow and, and, and the confidentiality is taken very seriously. So I'm sure that's very much appreciated by them to add this in. Yes. So. And to know, um, this has been a topic of conversation since the fall, so it wasn't, we didn't set it aside, it sort of has been bundled with the, the JLF policy, so this has been ongoing since yes. that, that first incident. It's been a very, um, I'm sure it a is. very good, uh, in-depth conversation. Um, it, yeah, It's been on our radar and something we've been working on ever since that. The other thing that I'm noticing that I think um, is an expansion, because it's in red, that you all added was, um, Identify or uh, expanding the definition of harassment um, as um, as there becomes more gender identity uh, definitions. How that is, it's not just race, color, sex, and sexual or orientation, but gender identifying and expression. I like the way that you have expanded to encompass more people um, and more situations where people might feel harassed, actually identify them. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Anything else? Before yeah. we vote, um, this is no oh, this, this is not a vote. Oh yeah, it's we're not voting. Policy. Sorry, first, first read, read, whatever. I, I've been That's thinking about this since we were voting on the earlier policies. Number one, I wanted to um, just kind of relay to the public again how robust this process has been. It's been an ongoing um, conversation. We rarely have well-attended policy committee meetings. Um, there are certain faces in the crowd that come every time and we're very appreciative of those people. However, these were very well-attended meetings. Um, we had staff, at one point we had a student, but we had, it could be almost all the guidance counselors in the district, uh, social workers, psychologists, and um, in particular, Jeff Shedd went out of his way to really, I think, help us kind of elucidate what we want to say about confidential employees and how important their role is and how it's not just about protecting these employees but also keeping them accessible to the students. Um, I think one of their concerns, which was a, a shared concern of mine, was a student who has had power taken from them there's a concern that with you know with a, a snap report being made you're, you're further taking power from them and that's kind of the you know we want to make sure that the people who have had you know an assault or something happened to them that they aren't brutalized yet again by the process and so it was it was incredibly delicately done it was a long process um, I need to thank hope in particular, who I think took on more than a policy chair really needs to, and I would love to thank Kathy Stankard for doing all her research. I, I think that this district needs to be really proud of itself for the work that we have done on these policies and around these issues. I'm certainly proud of us. I think we've all done a really good job. It's been thoughtful. It took this long because it needed to take this long. So thank you to everybody. <clears throat> Thank you so much, Elizabeth. Uh, uh, one more question. I don't know if this is the appropriate place or not. Um, so harassment, is that equal as bullying? Uh, I know we've identified race, color, and et cetera, and I know there's been harassment and bullying to someone who's either underweight or overweight. 
and dark can be expanded too. So uh, how can we add things like that and also open up for any other type of harassments as well that we may not see in the future? Okay. So I, I believe that we have within the, I think it's the weapons violence. We have a bullying. We have a bullying policy. We have a bullying policy. Oh, exactly. okay. Specific bullying policy. Yep. Okay. Um, and this is intended, um, this is intended to sort of fall under the, um, the Title IX, we, it's a, a Title IX State compliance okay. requirement. So it's sort of, um, it's specific to sexual harassment and, and other types of harassment okay. related to that. But there is, there's a policy. Another there's policy. a separate bullying policy. And no, I think we're saying there's, a, okay. there's actually another one. Another bullying policy. policy. Yeah. Okay. Yep. All right, thank you. I think it's J-I-C-K, but I'm not sure. It's another J. Um, I just wanted to piggyback a little bit on what Elizabeth said, because I do think that this topic warrants a little bit more um, notoriety and appreciation. But um, over the past couple of years, I feel like as a board, we have valued the work of the social workers in the school, and we have been growing that program. Um, I know it's been growing in the middle school, and it's in Pond Cove, where there's a request for this coming budget season. Um, and I think this is just the, the work that's being done with these policies to carefully think through it, um, to, to welcome the delicacy of it, the, the empowerment for the students, and the, the effect of what the process can do to a student who already may feel disempowered. Um, I just think it's all just a testament to how important we think the whole child the, the whole being and overwhelming um, overall well-being of the, the entire student um, is important to all of us. So thank you. So just um, final note, it's the first reading, so we'll be yeah. discussing that again at the next policy meeting, mm -hmm. which is open to the public and anyone who'd like to come and comment. That's great. Anything else? Okay, so next up where you have notifications of retirements, shall I just read through them? Sure. Uh, it's always a sweet sadness when, when people leave this district because um, so many of them give so much, yet their time has come to enjoy their days and pick up other uh, interests that they have. Um, so we send them off with such goodwill, uh, but with a little bit of sadness in our hearts for all that they do and all that they contribute. Um, we have five that are retiring as of now for next year. The first is Christine Newell, who is a Cape Elizabeth High School math teacher. We have Pat Fowler, uh, facilities and transportation system schedule, I'm going to add guru. Um, <laughs> Bernard Shannon is in the Facilities and Transportation Maintenance Worker. We have Lisa Leonard, who is a Cape Elizabeth Middle School French teacher, and Deb Casey, who is a Cape Elizabeth Middle School seventh grade teacher. We wish you all the best of luck as you head into the new chapter of your lives and are incredibly appreciative for the time you dedicated here in this district. Are there any school board agenda requests Okay, we have some committee reports. I'm thinking, hope you might be all done, or is there more to say? I'm good for today. Uh, we're going to be looking at ACAA again at the upcoming yes. meeting and several others. So stay tuned for the agenda on what those are going to be. There's some important policies. So it sounds like there's a little bit of a shift from what's been working, the, the group of policies that you've been wa working on since the fall, that now those are being tied up and you're heading into perhaps totally new territory. Is that correct? Yes. And I, I want to note that um, this, because this took up so much time, there's been a lot of policies that have been on people's radars. I know Donna really ha wants to get onto the suicide prevention policy. Um, graduation. There's other graduation. graduation, right? There's things that we need to do and, yeah. and we're really eager to get, get to those. That's great. That would be wonderful. Do we have technology committee? Nope. Okay. Pass, we have not met. Nope. March. Yep. 
Student wellness? Nothing. Buildings and grounds. Would you like to? Yes, sure. Yeah, we met on, was it Wednesday last week? I think it mm -hmm. was. Mm -hmm. yes. yes, it was, because it was the night of the hockey game um, against Greeley. So we had a smaller group, because um, some of our members were um, supporting our hockey players. Um, but it was nonetheless a robust conversation. Um, we started again, uh, it, it, this is all, it was recorded, um, and so it is all available um, to view at home, and I would recommend doing it. It's, um, I, I think it's really important to have as many voices as we can uh, participating in the, these conversations. Um, but we started, um, again, uh, just identifying the mission of the, group, um, identifying the strategic goals that we came up with through the futures search uh, last spring. Um, and then uh, Perry presented um, a chart that um, indicated just how much our um, spending on the facilities has escalated in the last uh, couple of years. Um, and, and it's, it's a dramatic escalation. Um, it, it's increase due primarily to the age of the buildings um, and their unanticipated costs that, um, that are tricky for the budget and, um, and tricky to plan for as far as personnel and, and what projects you're gonna be accomplishing. Um, we then moved into just an open group discussion um, and I think um, the gist of it at this point is that um, there's a lot of concern for the taxpayers and, and whatever decision we, um, whatever decision the group recommends to the school board, um, I think it is going to really be um, the, the impact of the, on the taxpayers is going to weigh very heavily in whatever decision is made. Um, so we hope to have some more information on that in our next meeting. Um, but it, it, the conversation continues. Um, and, um, and like I said, all voices are, are welcome in the conversation. We have another meeting next, is it next week? Mm -hmm. Is it on, yeah, March 17th um, at 6.30, again in the high school library. Anything you want to add? The architects will be there to answer some questions answer for questions. us at the next meeting, so. Mm -hmm. Okay, legislative liaison, there's nothing to follow up uh, on that. Great, uh, so announcement of upcoming meetings tomorrow, March 11th at 6.30, we have a school board budget workshop. We didn't quite feel like we had completed the conversations and the questions last week and that um, there's a little bit more to be done to stay on timeline in order to have the process complete in time for voting. Um, so we added this meeting in. I do wanna point out that it's in a unique location. It says here that it's the middle school it library. Is middle school it library. Um, is often either here or in the high school library, but please note <laughs> for the school board and anybody wanting to come, um, it is a public meeting that is over in the middle school library. Thank you for drawing attention to that. I know, it's unique. It is. Uh, March 16th at seven o'clock, the town council budget workshop. Um, they begin their sort of, they, they started their process of going through their budget, but they begin their, I guess, formal, more formal presentation, presentation to the entire council, um, similar to our first presentation when we sat and just listened to the different department heads speak. Um, so if anybody is interested in that, um, it, it, it bears interest to remember that really in the end there's one number, right? We have the, the town budget and we, part of the town budget, we have the, the school board budget, and so 
it, it's all the same pot in the end, right? And so uh, I would say that that is part of the reason that we started last year these joint finance committees between the school board and the town council. So there is more communication and understanding if they needed a big ticket item that we could be aware of it when we were planning our budget and vice versa. So um, that's why that is on our agenda because um, Town Council is presenting their information, their budget, and uh, school board members are welcome to go attend, I'm sure. Uh, Jamie Garvin, who is the finance chair, had mentioned that uh, theirs will start being taped this year as well. Uh, we have traditionally been taping our budget meetings, but the Town Council will start doing that as well. So hopefully um, that will be taped if you can't actually come. Uh, and then Kimberly was mentioning the next night, March 17th at 6.30 is the building committee. That will be in the high school library. March 19th at 8.30 a.m. is the paths committee. It's at the paths building this month, which is in Portland instead of the Westbrook location. Uh, March 19th as well at 7 p.m. is the continuation of the town council budget workshop. So similar to us, we had two days, they have two nights as well. March 24th is policy committee, it's at 3 p.m. in the Jordan Conference Room, which is right behind us here. And as well on the 24th is our next uh, school board budget workshop um, at 6.30 and that will be in the high school library. Um, I guess we only have one more motion. May I have a motion, please? I move we adjourn. May I have a second? <laughs> second. All in favor. Thank you so much, everyone. Um, school board members, can you not?